Hello everyone, welcome back to Perfected by Blood channel. My name is Rose Ramandi and I am excited because today we are going to talk about chapter 15 and 16 of the book of Revelation. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, I just want to invite you to subscribe because every week we are going to have a video teaching and right now the series we have is the book of Revelation. And also, if you haven't uh, signed up for the free ebook that we have, I just want to invite you to sign up for the free ebook Book, you get an ebook on how to really uh, start uh, studying the Bible and uh, we will give you some very simple guides you need to know in order to understand the Bible better. All right, so let's um, basically start with our teaching today. It's I'm going to have chapter 15 and 16 covered in one video and the reason is chapter 15 is the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation and it, it has the, uh, basically it's a preparation of of chapter 16. So chapter 15 explains to us what is going to happen basically in chapter 16 and chapter 16 gives us a little more information or details. But here's the thing, we are in chapter 15 and 16 are talking about the seven bowls. All right, so we are in chapter 15 and 16 that the seven bowls of the wrath of God are poured out. So today we're gonna understand the wrath of God and let me tell you, you're going to love it because the wrath of God, it's not like the wrath of man, all right? so. To Today we are going to look at the scriptures to understand what it means, even though there are many things that we can cover in chapter 15 and 16, and of course in one video we won't be able to take a look at all the details, but I do my best to give you what you really need, the main understanding or the main concept of every chapter, especially these two chapters, to to basically take it um, in your own study and ask the Lord to open up more, to open up the details in these two chapters together. And having said that, um, we do have a membership called PBB Revelation membership where we go in deep, in depth through the study of the book of Revelation. And it is just chapter, it is verse by verse teaching of the book of Revelation. And let me tell you the more details you have, the clear or the more, um, uh, I mean, clear, you, the, the more clear you can see a picture, all right? So, and that's the whole purpose of our job or our walk with the Lord. We have to pass on, we have to move on from a general phrases like, oh, Jesus forgives sin and really move into the details of it and understand what it means. Or we have to move on from a general phrases like Jesus is the savior and really get into the details. And that's what the book of Revelation all is about. Book of Revelation tells us exactly with the details what happened on the cross and how is it that God is dealing and how God deals with you even today so you can overcome through the finished work of the cross. So now we've been talking a lot <laughs> in this series uh, in the book of Revelation and if you haven't watched the previous teachings I just want to encourage you to after you finish this one go watch them because as I said it in the previous videos we covered a lot and I'm not gonna lay the foundation again here okay but I'm gonna just um uh, go through a summary of it to understand, just to remind ourselves, how did we get to chapter 15? Where are we in chapter 15 of the book of Revelation? Chapter 15 and 16, we are in the bowls. So how did we get to the bowls? Because the, the trumpets or the seven trumpets uh, were already sounded. So how did we get to the seven trumpets? Because there was a the scroll that had to be opened. It was the seven seals of the scroll. So the reason we are in the bowls or the plagues that we are going to see it in the chapter 15 and 16, the reason is there was a scroll on the throne that was opened. All right, so maybe one of the uh, essential or the most important concepts we need to understand in the book of Revelation is the understanding of what the scroll is, which we already covered it, I think, when we were in chapter five, and please go ahead and watch it. But I wanna share my screen here with you and just remind ourselves again, one more time, what really happened. Okay, so chapter five started with a scroll. So let's say this is the scroll that is sealed with seven seals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they are seals. 
So chapter six, we had the seals broken open. So now if the scroll, which another meaning for it is a book that is sealed and you open the seals of the scroll. So the scroll now is open. So in the seals, we have a closed book, but in the trumpets, we have an open book. But here's the thing, the moment you open up a book, what is your purpose? What, why are you opening up a book? The reason is you want to read basically what this book is saying. And that happened in the trumpets. So in the trumpets, what is written inside of the scroll, it's written. But now, here's the thing, the next, the next step is why are you reading a book? What's the purpose of a book? So today in this society that we live, sometimes we read a book because we want to have a good feeling or, you know, get encouraged, modified, built up, or have a knowledge so we can eventually live and bring it into our reality or day-to-day -day life. So basically what is written in the scroll, right? Eventually we want it to be manifested, right? or seen where in our life. So what I read in this, it has to be manifested and seen. So this is what happens in the bones. So we already covered that this is scroll that we talked about here. This is scroll is your inheritance. The scroll is the life of the Lamb of God. It's the life of Christ that is hidden inside every single one of us. It's a life that uh, each and every single one of us are supposed to live because it's the will of God for ourselves. So I already covered it when we were in chapter 55, so I'm not going to go through it again. But in the bowls here, what happens in the bowls is what the trumpets sounded are now in the bowls. Something is going to happen. So what the spirit Mm, shouted into our ear, ears or what the spirit revealed through the trumpets to us, now it can be seen. So now here's the thing, we need to understand that the trumpets are just, are the step of, it could be the step of a revelation. It could be a step, a step that you hear what the will of God is and how you're supposed to live as the son of God on earth. So basically you grow, you understand the knowledge of the son of God. But the knowledge is not good enough. We don't want to just have a knowledge of it and then move on. The whole purpose is that we can eventually see it happening in our lives. And that's what it's happening in the bowls. The bowls make the, make basically the work of God seen into, into our lives. So let me, uh, let me come back here and let me show you a couple of verses here. Look at Revelation chapter 15 and look at verse 3. It says, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. So do you see, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. So do you see, this, the bowls are revealing to us the marvelous work of God, or let's put it this way, not revealing, actually manifesting, causing the work of God to be seen. Now let's read, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations have come and worshipped before you. So do you see? All nations have come and worshipped before you. Something has happened to those nations that they have eventually come to the Lord and are worshipping. But now, look at this. For your judgments have been manifested. So now the interesting part is, so therefore the bowls that we see in chapter 15 and 16, they are for the purpose of manifestation of God's judgment. 
All right, so let me, sh let me show you something amazing here shortly, and then we will pick up in the bowls again. The word judgment here is actually the word righteous requirements. So, um, Masood and I have studied this word a lot, and basically the best translation that we came across said is the word righteous requirement. And you can also see that in Romans chapter 8. So that one word is also used in Romans chapter 8. Actually, we do have a teaching on the righteous requirement that is really good. And I want to, uh, you know, encourage you to go and watch that. It's a, it's a teaching from Masood on the righteous requirement. So go, you know, to our YouTube channel search. It's going to come up. So we will go through these verses in more details. But let me show you here because I want to show you that the bowls are the righteous requirements of God manifested. So what does that mean? If you take a look at verse 4 in Romans chapter 8, it says that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And if you read in the context in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, you realize that Paul here is talking about two, di two different walks that we can have, a walk in the flesh or the walk in the spirit. And then he goes on and he says, the reason you walk, someone walks in the flesh, it's because they have their thoughts or their mind put on, on the things of the flesh. And if you want to walk into a spirit, you must have your mind on the things of the spirit. Or let's put it this way. You, if you have a carnal fleshly mind, you will walk in the carnality and fleshly life of Adam. But if you have the spiritual mind, or let's say the mind of Christ, you will walk in the spirit. So here it says, the righteous requirement of the law only gets fulfilled, not by walking in the law according to the flesh, but actually by walking in the spirit. And if you continue reading it, you realize that what, as Paul writes it in many different places, in the book of Galatians, that it's not by you keeping the work, works of the law, but actually it's by faith of Jesus Christ. So in order for you to be able to walk in the spirit, you need to walk in faith. So if you walk in faith, you walk in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, you walk in faith. So, based, so therefore, walking in the spirit causes that righteous requirement of the law to be fulfilled. What was the righteous requirement of the law? The, the thing that was required for us in order to have life. You know, let me show you. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. And in Galatians chapter 3, let me show. Uh, okay, so let's uh, take a look at verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law, which law given, which could have given life, truly the righteousness have been by the law. So it says the law could never be against the promise because the law could never bring a righteous the righteousness that brings or that gives life. But the promise brings a kind of righteousness that gives life. So the law really doesn't go again, doesn't uh, basically, um, uh, is the law against the promise? It doesn't go against the promise because it's not even comparable to promise because the promise was supposed to bring that, that kind of righteousness so it can have life. So now, there was a, basically, so this righteousness of God in order to be manifested in us needed a righteous requirements. And that is by walking in the spirit or faith, or grace, and all the stuff that we know we have it in Christ in order for the judgment of God to be manifested in us. So now, go back to Revelation chapter 15 and 16. So what did we read? What needed to happen 
to us is now is going to happen to us here so that the works of God can be seen in us. All right. And simple as that, we know that it is by walking in the spirit or by walking in the faith. Therefore, chapters 15 and 16, the bowls are a place that not only your eyes are open to see, not only you have an ear that heard, you have already seen and heard what the spirit says, but all of a sudden your heart is risen or, you know, you are, your heart is ascended right so you are you have come to this place of not only seeing and hearing but also experiencing that righteous judgment of the lord now for example let's go to verse uh, 5 in Re revelation chapter 16 so this is the third bowl it says then the third angel poured out verse 4 and the, on the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood and i heard the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them uh, blood to drink, for it is their just due. Now, I'm going to get to these in details, but look at verse 7. And I heard another from altar saying, even so, Lord Almighty, true and righteous are your judgment so therefore revelation chapter 16 the bowls of the bowls are the bowls of judgment what are they revealing they reveal the righteousness of god okay so now let's take a look here we usually when we think about the judgment of god we think it's like the judgment of man but we must understand that it has a different meaning as much as the wrath of God has a different meaning. So I'm going to go and get there, but you need to be patient with me. I can give you, I can tell you the end result. And if that's what you're looking, you're looking for, move forward and get to the end result. But let me tell you, you won't get that depth and the joy of what I'm about to share with you, okay? That's why I wanna ask you to follow along with me and let your heart be touched. We are not gonna look, we are not here, just have a big mind, what is this, what is this, what is this? And never have that journey of understanding the depths of what we are reading. Okay, so let's continue and follow along with me. Look at verse one here in Revelation chapter 15. It says, I saw another sign in heaven great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them the wrath of god is complete okay so right now so what we understood so far is it's the judgment of god that needs to be manifested and then the wrath of god in the walls are completed so we are going to take a look at what the wrath of god is so Therefore, in, uh, you know, I'm gonna, uh, let me share my screen. Maybe it's easier <laughs> to share the screen here. All right, so I'm gonna bring this up a little for you because we just don't need all the other information. So the bowls, so in the bowls, what happened is judgment of God Uh, judgment of God is manifested. The wrath of God is basically completed. Okay, so this is what happens in the in the bowls, and that right there shows us the judgment of God and the wrath of God is toward you seeing the work of God. So what did we read? We read it in verse three, great and marvelous are your works. Do you see? So they are toward, I can write it down here, toward manifesting the work of God. All right, so now I want you to go back, let's go to verse um, 19 in Revelation chapter 16. It says, now the great city, 
was divided into three parts and the cities of nations fell and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fear, fierceness of his wrath. So therefore, if I want to show you here that wrath of God or the judgment of God, it's on the great city Babylon. Okay, so it's on the great city Babylon. That's why in the next couple of chapters, chapter 17 and 18 reveals to us how actually everyone who is dwelling in Babylon is coming out of the Babylon and how Babylon will be destroyed basically. So chapter 17 and 18, they're all in actually inside of the walls. It's, they are part of the walls here. So now, what is it happening here? Did you see it says all the cities of the nations fell? Do you see all the nations fell? But what did we read? We read in verse 4, verse, chapter 15, verse 4, that all nations have come before you to worship you, Lord, because how great is your marvelous, marvelous work. What does it show us to us? It shows that all the nations, all people who were dwelling in Babylon, who were dwelling in the city of Babylon, now when the work of God came on this city, caused these people to come out of a city and the city becomes desolate and that's why the city is destroyed and these people that they already made a city, they are entering into the, another city which is the city of living God and worshiping the Lord there. So basically what is happening in the walls are the wrath of God and judgment of God on Babylon to bring out the nations out of Babylon. In chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, uh, verse four, we see that Jesus Christ is calling everyone to come out of, the, uh, out of Babylon because Babylon must be, uh, destroy. Look at, uh, let me show you actually, look at verse 4 in Revelation chapter 18. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. So chapter 15, they were the plagues that they were going to pour out on Babylon. So the voice here says, my people come out of Babylon because Babylon must be destroyed. It's the city of, um, so I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna not gonna talk about chapter 17 because in chapter 17, it's the mystery Babylon, but it's a city of um, uh, confusion. It's the city where there is no light of the knowledge of God there. Simple as that. So it's not referring to any physical city here. So we are gonna, we already talked about it in previous verses that we are talking about a man that has the mind and the thoughts and the heart of the Babylonian God. We are talking about a man who is soulish and carnal, walks in the flesh. That's, that man is in the city of Babylon. So actually, you know, let me, so this is going to take me a little longer, but I have to show you here. Let's go to Genesis chapter, let's go to Genesis chapter 10. That's the place that you see the story of Babylon is happening the first time. So we are in Genesis, a story of Babylon. And I want to show you a couple of things here. And then in chapter 17 and 18, we talk more about Babylon, but Look at verse 8 in Genesis chapter 10, verse 8. And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on earth. Cush means black and Nimrod means rebellion. So let's read this. We changed those two names and names at the time they had meanings and people were, when they were hearing a name, they were hearing the meaning. So Cush begot or black begot rebellion and he began to be a mighty one on the on the on the earth he was a mighty hunter before the lord therefore it is said like nimrod the mighty hunter before the lord why is it saying mighty hunter before the lord like why is it comparing the like nimrod with the lord i mean like we know the mighty powerful god is the lord right why is it comparing this 
It's comparing the strength of this rebellion that started growing and coming up and says, you know, I'm going to reach out to heaven and I want to exalt myself. So mighty hunter before the Lord. So the Lord told basically to Peter that I'm going to make you fisher of man. Or let's put it this way. I'm going to make you the hunter of man. You are going to hunt people for the kingdom of God. Let's, we can say that, right? So here it says, he, the Nimrod was the mighty hunter before the Lord. And that means that the rebellion, black who begot rebellion, that rebellion started hunting people for his own kingdom. So look at verse 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So Babel means the word Babylon. Eric, Echad, and Kalne in the land of Shinar. So they all have meanings here. Okay, the, that, their names have a meaning here. And let me read the meanings for you. In the beginning of his kingdom, in the beginning of the kingdom of rebellion was confusion. So the word Babylon means confusion. Long and uh, difficult. Those are the next two words. And they were all in the land that flows with two rivers. So I don't have time to go there. But what do we see? We see that Babylon was the city of confusion. Why was it the city of confusion? Because it's sitting on a beast that has seven heads and has seven minds but we have only one head the Christ and that's why the new city Jerusalem has one head and that's why there is no confusion in that city so now going back to Revelation chapter uh, 15 and 16 the wrath of God or the judgment of God is falling on Babylon the city that is holding people captive in confusion People that they don't know the will of God. They are people that they don't know what God has for them. People, they, those who don't know, um, they don't hear the spirit. They don't see the spirit. They don't see the work of God manifested. It's the city that walks in the flesh. That is, I already talked about it when we were in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. We talked about the beast there. Babylon is sitting on those, on those beasts. So now, Everything is happening in chapter 16. It's the wrath that the wrath of the uh, basically the wrath of God is falling on the image of the beast, on the mark of the beast. It falls on the throne of the beast, and all these have are dwelling inside a city that is called Babylon. Now look at verse one in Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on earth. Do you see? It's not in heaven. It's on earth. So when we were in chapter 12, the sun was cut up into heaven and the dragon fell on earth. And now this dragon is on earth. The beast is on earth, deceiving the earthly carnal man. So here it says, now, the wrath of God is going to pour out on the dragon and on the beast and on the Babylon and everything that is holding you captive. The close as a story that I can bring into your attention to understand the plagues that is talking here is the story of Moses. That when God sent Moses to Egypt, he brought them out of Egypt how did he bring them out of Egypt? So you probably know the story, the plagues. The plagues weren't on the children of Israel. The plagues came on Pharaoh and Egypt. So we all know that those are the symbolic, there, there's a message and meaning for us. Something happened, but we need to understand that Egypt was the story of sin and the slavery of sin. And Pharaoh was the one who was holding them into captivity. So that, or, in, or we, can, we can really say that what is holding you into a slavery, what is still holding you into on the carnal understanding of the Adamic mind, what is whole, still is feeding you with the food of Babylon or with the wine of Babylon, what is still feeding you, or holding you to stay captive in Babylon. That's what is 
basically the wrath of God or the bulls or plagues are coming on them. So now I want to bring this, that we are not talking about people here, guys, because in the Old Testament, the enemy, people, the enemy was people to them because they were carnal and they couldn't understand the message of the scriptures. They couldn't see and read the word of God in the spirit and they didn't understand it in the spirit. So they took it carnally and they brought this and condemnation for people. But when you come to the New Testament, you realize that the enemy are not people. The enemy are not cities. The enemy are not this country and that country. The enemy is death. The enemy is sin. The, the enemy is the carnal mind. The enemy is the wisdom of earthly man, Adam. The enemy is what is not letting you to believe. The enemy is the unbelief. The enemy is what is um, holding you back so you don't walk in the fullness of the power and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The enemy is the false identity that you and I took upon ourselves. The enemy is our experiences that we have in the flesh. And let me put all these things that I said in one word. The enemy is the old man. That where is the old man? The old man that is still living inside of you and still wants to bring his head up once in a while and have a, um, a message and get you to believe so and get you follow into a different direction. That's why when you see, for example, in verse um, 8, it says that it says, uh, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire and now because we don't understand the scriptures and we read it carnally we really think the judgment of God or the wrath of God is to pour out his uh, wrath on people on earth that they don't believe in him and we don't understand if that's the case then how can you say that all nations have come before you and every tongue will confess and every knee will bow down so the man that is the man or actually the man, it's not, it's not, it shouldn't be uh, the, you know, man should be man. It's talking about the old man. So let me give you the greatest hint you can have in order to study the book of Revelation and its understanding. It's the fight of two men. Our life, our struggle is that our true identity is the man, Jesus Christ. And the false identity that we took upon ourselves is Adam, the earthly man. Earthly, soulish man, heavenly and a spiritual man. This is who we are, the truth, but this is where we live, the reality. Let me say it again. This is, where, this is who we are, the truth, the Christ, the spiritual man is our identity. This is who we are. But our reality is Adamic mindset, Adam life, this man here. And that's why the bulls are coming into the false beliefs and the false uh, knowledge and wisdom, the beasts that are coming out of the, your soul and your um, heart and your mind to bring you and make an image of God that is false for you. That's what the bowls of the wrath of God is pouring on. Like, let me show you here. Look at verse 2 in Revelation 16. It says, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth. Do you see? Not the heaven. The earth. And a foul and loathsome sore came upon men who had the mark of the beast and those who worship the image. We only talked about it in Revelation chapter 13. The man that has the mark of the beast and worship the image is the earthly, soulish, carnal man. Why would you worship the beast if you are a spiritual man? But who is this man? It's you that the carnality that lives inside of you for a long time that was our identity guys that's what who we were and all of a sudden he came he invaded our life we were sitting in darkness the life came and what happened was we realized oh my goodness this is not who i am i am what he says that i am 
And I am the spiritual man. He revealed to us who we are, not, we, we, not who we became in Adam. And, and, but the thing is, God knows, as he writes it in the book of Revelation, is the story is that even you have the revelation of your true identity in Christ, that's not the end of the story. You are going to be only in chapter 7 <laughs> or 8 or 9 or 12. You haven't finished that perfection or journey. So what you know now must become now must seen and manifested and the bowls are going to complete the wrath of God. So not to start the wrath of God, to complete the wrath of God. When did the wrath of God start? The moment you said Jesus Christ is Lord, that was when you, your, that enemy that was blinding your eyes and your heart was dealt with, was destroyed, was kicked out of your authority, the authority of your life. That unbelief, that's the beginning of the wrath of God. When do we see that? Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, the sun is risen, went to the heaven and kicked the dragon out of heaven. So what was what you were under authority, what the authority of dragon is taken from you. So now this is this is where we are. And unfortunately, I am convinced one of the reasons, probably the main reason <laughs> that majority of Christians are walking around, most of us, um, probably all of us in some degree of our lives, walking around and powerless, knowing things but haven't seen it happen. Um, myself part of that it's because we 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 haven't come to the fulfilling or the completion of the wrath of God what God has started in our lives must come to fulfillment and the moment you understand the book of revelation in every degree of your life every season of your life you find yourself in different multiple places in the book of Revelation. Sometimes you realize I am in chapter 16 and the wrath of God is being completed in me. And finally, I am going to start seeing the manifestation of who he is. So, so, or, you know, one of the reason, one of the other reasons that most of us still walking around is because we don't think that we must come to a place of seeing and experiencing the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's why the bowls are toward that. So, for example, we read it in first in bowl, um, first bowl that is a man who has the mark of the beast on earth, the earthly man, carnal mind. And let me tell you this. Do you know what it says? For so long you try to get yourself free from the slavery of whatever you are in. Whatever you obey, you are a slave to it. It could be anything. So the stories of Bible, it just give, gives us some understanding of what is happening. Egypt, the children of Israel, they were in the slaves to Pharaoh. What's your Pharaoh? What's, what's your Egypt? And here it says, Oh, marvelous are your works, O oh God, because you are going to deliver me from this slavery that I am. You are going to deliver me. Why? Because you are pouring out the bowl of wrath on what is holding me back and what's not letting me to be free to worship you, to, to manifest your work. Right? So... Let me show you one more thing. Actually, today I was going to talk a lot about something else. So the Spirit is leading me toward this direction. And I'm going to follow and we'll see how it goes. So look at verse um, second ball. Um, so verse 3 in uh, Revelation chapter 16. It says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man. <laughs> and... Every living creature in the sea died. Do you see the word living creature is actually, it's a living soul. So now we must let the scripture interpret the scripture. It says the living soul in the sea. 
Okay, so now do you remember where in the book of Revelation we saw a thing, a living thing to come out of a sea? Where did we see that? Because this is a book, this is the chapter of the same book, okay? It was in chapter 13 that in chapter 13 it says, I stand on the sand of the sea and then I saw a beast coming out. The beast had mouth, the beast had foot, the beast, beast had head. So it's a living thing. Okay, so therefore the bull poured on the sea that the beast was there. So it's pouring on the beast that is eventually causing people to worship the worship beast, to worship the beast and not the Lord. Okay. So now look at verse four. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and a springs, a springs of water and they became blood. And I heard at the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord. The one who is and who was and who is to come. Do you see? It is now on the rivers. So let me see. Let me show you something. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12. So, <clears throat> excuse me, Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse 15. So the serpent spewed, spewed water out of his mouth like a flood. It's the same word as river. After the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the river. Okay, do you see? Now let's go back to Revelation chapter 16 and uh, look at verse 14. This is bowl number six. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. But look at the verse before that. It says they are coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Okay, so we need to understand, we are not reading science fiction here, okay guys? We are, these are the spiritual messages to help us understand what is coming out of a mouth. So the food goes in the mouth, the words come out of the mouth. So the dragon had the flood or the river came out of its mouth. What does that mean? That means the wisdom is sort of flowing together like a river in words of wisdom and knowledge and understanding of the earthly man started coming out. And now here it says, the wisdom that was in your heart, in your soul, now it starts coming into your mouth. And let me tell you, God must heal not only the heart, not only the mind, not only your thought, but also your words and your mouth. That's why the, the angels are saying, oh, righteous you are, oh Lord. So now I don't want to go through all of it, okay, because it definitely requires a little more study here, all right? It's not it's not the whole thing that what I'm sharing here is not the whole thing. It has obviously a lot more into it. But what I'm trying to say is that this wrath of God that we are seeing, it is not on you and it is not on people. It's on actually what is holding you back. It's actually on that false image. It's that wisdom that is not from above. It's that on that soulish, carnal, earthly wisdom. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> All right. Look at verse 17. Um, actually, let's read from verse 16. It's a beautiful verse here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also for Greek, for in it, in what? In the gospel. Do you see? For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from, revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God. Oh, that's an interesting, right? It's talking about the wrath of God. Right before that, it's talking about the gospel, the righteousness of God. Now, it's talking about the wrath of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. This is Revelation chapter 15 and 16. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven in the bowls or in the plagues. 
that one sentence here it's explained in two at least two chapters in the book of revelation so the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man did you see, did you pay attention the careless leading of reading of the scripture says the wrath of god is revealed on man no this is not what it says the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man not on man on unrighteousness of man so the man <laughs> who took unrighteousness or ungodliness upon himself that's babylon that's the beast that's what needs to be destroyed so you can come before him and worship him because you were a slave now he set you free um all right so now let's um let's go to uh, revelation chapter 15 i have a few minutes here i want to give you amazing revelation here <laughs> on the wrath of god it's going to be powerful all right so now so far we understood that this wrath of god is against the unrighteousness of man let me uh, share my screen here so therefore babylon is the city of unrighteousness okay so what is in the babylon unrighteousness what's going to come on babylon judgment of god to bring what righteousness to man so this is what is happening so the the babylon must be destroyed the unrighteousness of man must be destroyed now look at verse um look at verse so we are in chapter 15 verse 1 i saw a sign seven angels for in them the wrath of god is complete but a few verse before that it's talking about the wrath of god again and we must understand what the context is talking about so look at this so the angel verse 19 in revelation chapter 14 okay so it says the angel thrust his sickle into the earth do you see to the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and threw it into the great wine into the great wine press of the wrath of god oh okay so did you see there is a harvest that is happening in earth okay and now it's that the sickle is for harvesting the fruit of the earth that is ripe but it says when that when got that fruit of the earth and now it says the wine of the earth threw that into the wine press of the wrath of god now look at this and the wine press was trampled outside the city and blood came out of wine press so now keep this in mind but let's go a little back verse 14 in chapter 14 of the book of revelation it says then i looked and behold a white cloud and on the cloud sat one like the son of man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle so do you remember in the beginning of the book of revelation behold he is coming with the cloud we are in chapter 14 and he has come in the cloud so do you see it's we are actually we, we are not even toward the end of the book of revelation we are he came on the clouds in chapter 14 because he came to do what here he came to do the harvest that is happening so he has a sickle so now look at uh, verse 17 actually let's read verse 15 so good it says and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud trust your sickle and uh, reap for the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth is ripe so he who sat on the cloud uh, trust in his sickle and the earth and on the earth and the earth was uh, ripped 
right? So now, verse 17, then another angel came out of temple of heaven and having a sharp sickle. So do you see, it's a time of harvesting, or let's put it this way, gathering the fruit of the earth, okay? So that's why verse 19 says, when he gathered, not really, gathered the wine of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. All right, so let me show you here, guys. Hopefully you guys are following here and grabbing your Bible with me because I'm sharing a lot of good stuff here. All right. I'm going to make a little more room for all of us here. All right, so therefore... So what do we have? So there was, there was a fruit that needed to be what? Needed to be um, gathered or harvested, right? It says wine. So how do you get wine? You get that wine from what? From grapes, right? So it's interesting that it says wine because it gives the full the the full product the completion of the product here because it says the the end of flesh basically have come i'm going to show you that so now uh, so basically what do we have we have i'm gonna okay so i get this one out of the way all right so what do we have we probably have a um, wine tree, right? So we, and then we have grapes. Hopefully this looks like, okay. So we have grapes, right? And then all these trees are in a vineyard. Do you guys see? Yes. They are in a vineyard. All right. So it says he put out a sharp sickle and because those grapes are ripped basically and put them in the wine press. So this is wine press of the wrath of God. What happened was when he got in there, right? When these grapes got in there and he Verse 20 says, the wine press was trampled outside of the city and blood came out. Okay, so can I show the blood, for example, like this. Okay, so this becomes, this becomes the wrath of God. Okay, sorry. This become the the bowl or the wrath of God. Okay, did you see that? All right, so now let's go to Isaiah chapter five. So in Isaiah chapter five, if I can find my Isaiah chapter five, here you go. So Isaiah chapter five is the story that God is talking here. Now, let me sing to my well-beloved, a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest wine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected to, be, to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. So do you see? So it didn't bring good grapes. Therefore, it, it brought another grapes. It brought a wild grapes. Or even we can say the word wild here is a stink. So he brought a stinky grapes, the grapes that they, they stunk, basically. Now, look at verse 3. It says, And now, O, o inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, p judge, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, 
did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedges and it shall be burned and break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. Look at verse 7. So, so there is a story of God who has the vineyard and put on and now expected for a good grapes to come and now didn't come. Now look at verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. All right, so let me, let me write this here. I love it when the Bible interprets itself. Okay, so the vineyard of the Lord... So the vineyard is the house of Israel. Okay. The house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his plants. Okay. So this plant here, this plant that is producing grapes is actually man of Judah. All right, bear with me here. All right. So he looked for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. Okay. So verse two says he looked for grapes and he saw the white grapes. So therefore the grapes, the fruit of the plant, he looked for justice but he saw oppression. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to write down up here. Hopefully you guys can see. So the grapes were supposed to be justice, which is the word judgment. And the grapes are righteousness. Okay, so did you see? He, God looked for judgment and righteousness, but he found oppression and a cry for help. Okay, so let's, let's remember. What was the wrath of God? The wrath of God was on unrighteousness. So basically what we can see here, he, God looked for judgment and righteousness, but he found unrighteousness and uh, ungodliness. Let's put it this way. So what did he do? He grabbed them. He poured them out there. And now something amazing happened. Let's go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, guys. Isaiah 63. Now look at verse 2. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like one who treads in wine press. Look at verse 3. I have trodden the one wine press alone. I have trodden the wine press alone. And from the people no one was with me, for I have trodden, trodden them in my anger. So what did he trodden? He trodden the grapes. What was it? the fruit of plants. What was the fruit of plant? Men of Judah. Who are the men of Judah? Those who were supposed to be part of the family of Israel. Who is the Israel? The Israel of God, the new Jerusalem, the city of God, or the family of God, basically. So here says, what happened? So he didn't find it. What did, what did he trodden? He trodden the ungodliness and the unrighteousness that people produced. All right? So now, and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. Look at verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeem has come. 
Therefore, look at, um, look at in the middle of verse 5. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 16. Keep your finger here. Revelation chapter 16. So, actually, Revelation chapter 14. And the wine press, verse 20. And the wine press was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the wine press. So do you see, why is your apparel red? Because I trampled the unrighteousness and ungodliness that man produced in my own vineyard. I trampled them in the wine press of the wrath of God outside of city. Do you see the picture of the cross? Do you see that Jesus was trampled outside of city, let's say? Do you see that Jesus was crucified in, in the city? What was he doing? He was trampling upon the unrighteousness that man was producing. Okay, so do you see my, God, my apparel is red? Why? Because the blood of grapes have stinked my, my, my garment, have come into my garment. But I've done this because the day of the vengeance was in my heart. The vengeance for what? The vengeance that I can finally bring salvation to my people. Look at verse 7. Do you remember, before we move on, do you remember when Jesus showed up in Luke chapter he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me he has anointed me to preach the gospel to open the eyes of the blind and he quoted from actually he quoted from Isaiah 61 and right in the middle of the verse he stopped and he didn't talk about the vengeance of God let me show you here look at verse 61 in Isaiah chapter 61 the Spirit, verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to, pre to preach good tidings to the poor, right? This is exactly what Jesus said. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and the opening of the prison, open, opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And Jesus stops here and he doesn't read the the rest of this verse what is the rest of the verse the day of the vengeance of our god so usually people say oh jesus didn't read it because jesus didn't come to bring the vengeance of god no 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 when jesus finished that he said this scripture has been fulfilled in your earring he didn't read the day of the vengeance of our god because it hadn't been fulfilled yet it was going to be fulfilled on the cross so he reads to the point that has already been fulfilled. And later on when he goes to the cross, then that portion of the scriptures is fulfilled. Because what was the day of the vengeance? The day that God trampled the, un the grapes of the earth, the fruit of the earth, the unrighteousness and ungodliness that man produced in flesh. God trampled it on the cross and put an end to, the, to it. That's the day of the vengeance. And that's why verse 2, it says in Isaiah 61, the day of the vengeance of our God to come forth all who mourn. So do you see, the day of the vengeance of our God is toward bringing the comfort to those who mourn. So the wrath of God is actually, Moles 15 and 16, it's to bring eventually, to bring a comfort to you, to bring a rest to you. Why? Because he has delivered you from your enemies, what he did to the children of Israel from Egypt. So now let's go back to Isaiah chapter 63. So no one was there, my arm saved me. So one man, he went, he finished the work, he shouted, it is finished right? Let me show you. Keep your fingers on Isaiah 63 and let's go to Revelation 16. Hopefully you guys are seeing what I'm saying here. Look at verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl. So this is the seventh bowl and final bowl. So pulled out his bowl on the, in, into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from throne saying, it is done. And there was noises and thunderings and lightnings and there was a great earthquake. Do you see the cross here? Do you see that is the cry 
that Jesus had that it is done? Do you see that the seven bowls that we see here is the completion of the work of God in the, uh, on the cross? One man made it perfect, walked into it, completed that work, completed the wrath of God, was resurrected from the dead, became the firstborn from the dead. And now he is coming to you and you must follow him to the cross. You must follow him to the cross so that you cry out, it is finished. All the enemies are destroyed. So do you see the picture of the cross? Do you see how the wrath of God is completed when you pick up your cross and follow him to the cross? Do you see that's when eventually the cross becomes the place that all the enemies are made your footstool? The cross becomes the place that the wrath of God is poured on your enemies? Becomes, becomes a place that um, the, you, you start seeing the work of God? And then what happens? Let's go back to Isaiah chapter Isaiah 63. After I show the after I show my wrath and the day of vengeance is done. So what is the day of vengeance? It's the day that finally you and I willingly go on the cross and let that man inside of the wrath of God to be completed and get that man nailed to the cross now look at this look at verse 7 now then what happens here so I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us did you see that so the day of the vengeance of God the day of the wrath of God is eventually brings you to a place to realize the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord. Now look at this. And the great goodness toward the house of Israel. So now, what was the house of Israel? The house of Israel, let me show you the picture here for one more time. The house of Israel was the vineyard that had originally produced wild or stink grapes, the unrighteousness and ungodliness. But when God came and he showed his wrath by cutting off the grapes and put it into the um, wine press, put an end, trampled the unrighteousness of man and ungodliness of man so that so that he can show the loving kindness of the Lord and the great goodness toward the house of Israel. Oh, come on, guys. So if you really think about it, if you're sitting in a slavery and you're being beaten and you're, you are not free, so you, you will thank the one who set you free from it. This is what is happening here. Okay, so now look at verse 8. It says, for he said, surely they are my people, children who will not die. So he became their savior. In their affliction, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love, in his pity, he redeemed them. Okay, so now going back to Revelation 15 and 16, and just to wrap up what we just said, it's the place that God finally finish, uh, finishes the work of Christ uh, cross in your life. It's where that you finally start seeing and experiencing what you have heard and seen. It's where you experience and the work of God is manifested in your life. And that's why verse seven, chapter 17 and 18 are inside of bowl 17 and then right after that we have the marriage supper of the lamb and then we have the throne and then we have the new city and we get to the end of the book of revelation so this is amazing i don't know i pray i hope that you had an ear to hear what the spirit says and i just pray that god may stretch your understanding to understand the mysteries of jesus christ in another level to realize that we are not here to say who is going to go to heaven to bring christ down and who's going to go to hell or beneath or to the sea or beyond the sea to 
to bring Christ up. But the word of God is inside of us. He's inside of us. And our battle every day is against the old man. And let me tell you, be rejoiced because he is coming to ripe the earth. He's coming to gather the the fruit of the earth to pour out his wrath on what is oppressing you so that you can finally rise up to be who you meant to be, to inherit the land, not only to come out of Babylon, but also to inherit the land that the Lord God has given you. All right, guys, if you haven't subscribed, guys, I just want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we are going to continue the book of Revelation in, in the following weeks. And um, other than that, until next week, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you guys.